seduced by false teachers because they stand on the power of God's Word. I want to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. The Bible says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven, and we were with him in the sacred mountain. Listen to verse 19 through 21. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of the scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now remember with me, we said last week, the key word in, the, in this book of Second Peter is the word knowledge. And in these specific verses, specifically verses 12 through 15, Peter is really, he wants his readers and for us to remember something that's already been taught to us some truths about the Word of God. He uses the word remind, he uses the word refresh, and he uses the word remember. Now, I don't know how many of you are golf fans, but Jack Nicholas is considered to be one of the greatest golfers of all time, and, and um, he's called the Golden Bear, and for many, many years he was the undisputed number one golfer in the world. And he was asked how he kept on top of his game. His answer really is interesting. He said that at the end of every golf season, listen to what he did, he would go back to his very first coach who taught him the basics of golf and he'd have him reteach the basics all over again. He would actually, every year he would go back and he would learn the basic building blocks of a good golf swing. And, and there wasn't anything new to learn. There was just the need to be reminded again of the basics. And it worked. He became the greatest golfer there ever was. And think about this. He won 18 major championships in 24 years. No one's won more championships. All because every year he went back to the very first thing he learned and relearned it. So I want to ask, we're looking at today, what, what is it that Peter wants us to remember about the Bible? Two things. First, he wants us to remember about the authority of the Bible. You know, there's got to be a final authority in all matters for the child of God. I mean, you know... In this culture and in our world today, w people have become their own authority. Have you ever just talked to someone about something that you disagree with them on? And they want you to hear them, and they want you to affirm their opinion, but then they turn around and make you feel like a complete idiot because you have a different opinion. You ever met people like that? We've, we've kind of lost the ability to disagree on anything in this world. And there's got to be an authority. And, and the authority is not our individual conscience. It's not the teaching of the church or any particular denomination. It is God's Word, the Bible. When we deal with the issues of life and spiritual warfare and all the difficulties, listen, we've got to have a Word from God that's authoritative in our lives. And so the Bible's essential to our lives. It's essential to our walk with God. And no disciple understood this more than Peter. I mean, he had a lot to say about the Bible. But let's look at what Peter believed about the Bible. The first thing he believed is that it was the source of salvation. He writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. Peter knew that the only way to get into God's family was by grace through faith, like we talked about last week, through faith in Jesus Christ. And just like in... A physical birth, there's two parents, a mom and a dad. In our spiritual birth, there's really two parents also. There's the Spirit of God which draws us to Christ, convicts us of sin, gives us the ability to receive Him, but then there's also the Word of God. And through the Word of God, we receive the message of God's love in Christ. If we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't know what to do. 
Romans 10, 17 puts it this way. Faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And so, listen, he believed it was the source of salvation. He believed also that it would last forever, that it was eternal in nature. He said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, that all men are like grass, and all their glories like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And he was actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. And he was teaching us this, that everything in this life will eventually fade away. Bank accounts, IRAs, um, any kind of awards or accolades, any kind of, it'll all fade away. But the word of our God, the Bible says, stands forever. It will never fade away. He believed that it was eternal. And he also believed that it was the key to spiritual growth. He wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn babes... Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. Now, it is natural for a believer to grow in the same way that it's natural for a baby to grow and to develop. But here's the thing. You know, when we have babies and, and I, you know, we've got a lot of babies around here and I've got to hold some of them. And I've got to tell you, when I start holding them, I hold them for a few seconds and all of a sudden inside of me wells up this desire to have a baby. And so I give them back real quickly because I'm like, no, I don't want any more. You know, <laughs> that desire starts. <laughs> yes, my wife is <laughs> rejoicing with me on that. Yeah. But we feed them. We kind of do everything for them as babies. But as they get a little bit older, how many of your kids are like my kids and they have no problem telling you when they're hungry? Yeah. Every five minutes it seems like. You just ate. Where's my snack? You just ate dinner. Where's, where, where, I want a snack. You just ate lunch. Where's, where's dinner? I'm hungry. Go to bed. When's breakfast? Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Here's the thing. We've got to, as believers, have a plan for growing. And a key part of that plan is getting into the Word of God, studying it for ourselves. If I fed my children every Sunday morning one meal... Do you think they grow real well? No. In fact, I, hopefully you'd call the police on me and we'd have some major, you know. But somehow, some of God's people thought, if I can come to church on Sunday morning and hear a message, I'm good for the rest of the week. And we put the Bible down and we don't ever interact with it through the week. And we wonder why our spiritual lives are so anemic. Because we've got to have a plan. The key to spiritual growth is being in the Word of God. And, and why, let me just ask this. Why did Peter believe this? Why did Peter believe it? You know why he believed it? First of all, he was an eyewitness of Jesus. Verses 16 through 18 teach us that he saw Jesus with his own eyes. And he was a faithful witness. He's giving a personal testimony of what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. He not only saw Jesus in his physical sense when he was there, but he saw him glorified before him. And he wrote it down, and he, he was telling us that he saw him, but he was also telling us that greater than his eyewitness, greater than his personal testimony, was the fact that God has given us his word. And he believed it. But he was not only an eyewitness of Jesus. You know why he believed the Bible the way he did? Because Jesus believed it. He realized Jesus was a firm believer in the power of the Scriptures. Jesus over and over quoted from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. L listen to some things that Jesus said about the Bible. He said in John 5, 39, I'll put it on the screen, you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me. Jesus was saying, study the Scriptures, you'll find out it's all about me. And so the only way to salvation is through the Scriptures. It's Matthew 24, he says, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. He said the Word of God is eternal. He also said this in John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. He believed, Jesus believed, that the key to spiritual growth was in the Word of God. And so Jesus saw the, the Old Testament as the Word of God and he totally trusted it. And here's the thing, folks. Many people today want to accept Jesus in the fact they think he's a great man and all these kind of things. And they, they want to talk a lot about Jesus but they reject portions of the Bible. And so, well, that's not really God's Word. Here's the thing. Either Jesus knew what He was talking about or He didn't. Either Jesus was telling the truth 
about God's Word or he wasn't. And so if a person believes in Jesus to be consistent, we've got to believe that the Bible's teachings are true because that's exactly what Jesus taught. And so, listen, there's an authority for us, and it is the Word of God. So Peter wanted us to know the authority is the Bible, but Peter also wanted us to know one other thing. He wanted us to know about the inspiration of the Bible. Now, this might be the most important thing I'm going to tell you today about the Bible, is about the inspiration, and here's why. Some people would have you believe that the Bible's filled with errors, it's nothing more than the words of men about God and other religious matters. They point to it and say, see, there's, it's just filled with errors, it's not really God's word, it's not really true. Maybe you know someone like that in, in your life. Others, though, view the Bible as, well, maybe it's got some truth, but some of it's not right. Some of it's true and some of it's not true. And, and they go so far as to say, well, you know, when you read it and, and it wells up inside of you, then it becomes the Word of God. And listen, folks, the Bible itself declares that it is, in fact, the Word of God. First Thessalonians chapter 2, here's what Paul writes. He said, we thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as it actually is the Word of God which is at work in you who believe. And so the Bible's not just a collection of stories and fables and myths, and it's not merely human ideas about God. Here's what happened. Through the Holy Spirit, God revealed who He was and His plan to certain believers. And they wrote down those words in the Bible, and they wrote it down for us. And that process is known as inspiration. Now it's important that you listen to this. First of all, what's the meaning of inspiration? What, is, what does that word even mean? We talk about inspiration. Literally, the word means God breathed. Everybody say that. God breathed. All right? Now, let me explain that. The word inspiration is made up of two words. The word theos and neustos, which are God and breath. And that means that the Bible is a God-breathed book. And that simply means this. That means that God is the author of it. It means that every sentence, every word of the Bible was given by God's creative breath. I want you to see 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I got it from the NLT because I really like the way it says it. It says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people for every good work. And so basically what these verses are teaching is this. God is the ultimate author of the Bible. It is his word. The old theologian B.B. Warfield said it this way, that the Bible speaks in such a way that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And so when we read his word, we're reading his words because the Bible's God breathed. Now, I want to look at the second thing. Peter really deals with what we would call the how of inspiration. He tells us exactly how the Bible was inspired. He tells us that the Holy Spirit guided the writers of the Bible so that they wrote down without error the very words of God. He says that in verse 20. Above all, you must understand, no prophecy of the Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And, and what he's saying is this that God used these writers to bring us his words. God used their personalities. God used their background. God used their life experiences. If I had four people, we were talking this morning in Sunday school about the Gospels, the four different Gospels and how they give us this record of who Jesus was, but they're all a little bit different. If I had four people stand up here and tell you the same story and experience that they all experienced, do you think that they would all tell you exactly the same and exactly the same words? No, they'd use their own words. Some would put an emphasis on something that others didn't. So God used these people and their backgrounds and, and, and all those things. But when he did that, he guided them in such a way that they did not tell us their words. They brought us the very words of God. And so understand, the Bible is completely trustworthy because God was in control of the writing. In fact, First John says it this way. We don't even need others to teach us 
because the Bible is sufficient for us. God's Word is sufficient. So that's kind of how the Bible came about. God used these people, used their lives, their personalities, their backgrounds, and all these things, but He guided them in such a way that they gave us exactly what God wanted us to have in His Word. Now, here's the extent of inspiration. The original manuscripts that Peter actually wrote and that Paul actually wrote, they were literally inspired. In other words, they were literally breathed out by God as they wrote. But God has preserved His Word through the ages. Here's the thing. Only those originals were literally breathed out by God. But God has taken care to make sure that every generation has His Word. Listen to this. In 1874, the Bible was under attack. And there was a man named John W. Haley, and he, he published a defense against what are called alleged discrepancies in the Bible. If you've ever been to Bible school, you always have to write a paper on alleged discrepancies in the Bible. And he wrote this book kind of defending uh, the, the Bible. And in his preface, this is what he wrote. He wrote, finally, let it be remembered that the Bible is neither dependent upon nor affected by success or failure of my book. Whatever may become of the latter... Whatever may be the verdict passed upon it by the intelligent public, the Bible will stand. In the ages yet to be, when its present assailants and defenders are moldering in the dust, and when our very names are forgotten, God's Word will be, as it has been during centuries past, the guide and solace of millions. Listen to what God has said about His Word. Look at Psalm 119, verse 89. God says, Your Word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And I want you to f follow this verse, Isaiah 59. Isaiah writes, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on forever. And what God is promising in that verse is that he would keep His Word for us. And we would have His Word in our language for our generation. Now let me ask you this question. Does God keep His promises? Does He? If God keeps His promises, as we say He does, then God has kept His Word through these many copies of the originals and the translation into other languages. And you know what? When we hold the Bible, we can confidently trust it. It is God's words to us. So let me just sum this up. Uh, the doctrine of inspiration is simply this, that accurately and authoritatively the words of God were given to us. They were recorded by men and they would be preserved by God so that we would have His very words in our generation. And so we have the Word of God today and we can trust it. Now, at the beginning of the message, I asked you to hold up your Bibles. Remember that? How many of you remember that? All right, somebody, okay, just make sure you're awake. All right. Now I want you to do something different. Now I want you to hold up your cell phones. Go ahead. I'm giving you permission to take out your cell phone in church. And you're not getting one either, JJ, okay? Um, hold up your cell phones. Hold them up high if you got them. All right? Jim France, do you have a cell phone? I just want to, no, you don't have one? Okay, I just want to. Um, hold up your cell phones. Now, holding that up, I want to ask you the same question. How important is your cell phone to you? Think about that for a minute. How important is your cell phone to you? Now, I'm going to close with a, it's actually a shorter video than the last one I showed. But I want you to watch this and think about how important is your cell phone to you. Go ahead. Finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But to hear what you would say God 
Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be with you, and in the quiet, hear your voice. Just imagine, seriously, I know it's funny, but what if God's Word were important to us as our cell phones? This week, i got to tell you, this, this is a great little story. <clears throat> um, my kids are always, and if you have any kind of an iPhone, you know your kids always want it because they want to play games on it. They want to, or maybe they want to call China, I don't know. But they're always borrowing it, and, and we, we are... In our house, we, we make our boys read um, a certain amount every day. Um, we're trying to also help them to understand that the Bible is God's Word. And I've been blessed by, you know, sometimes I'll walk into the living room and J.J.'s sitting there with his Bible open reading. But this week, um, they had, J- you know, in Pine City, they have two-hour reading classes. Now, I'm a nerd, so that's exciting to me. But for other people, that's got to be rough. But Jace wanted to take a book into school. And so Tuesday, he was just bent. He... Mom, Dad, can I take my Bible to read? Yeah, absolutely you can. And of course the little things go through your brain, but I'm thinking, man, here is a seven-year-old. Did I get that right? Oh my goodness, I'm glad. <laughs> I say that because the, the other day I asked J.J., how old is Jace? And he goes, come on, Dad, really? <laughs> There's a seven-year-old who, who understands there's something special about the Bible and wants to, be, wants to make it a part of his life. In 1521, in April, a man named Martin Luther appeared before his accusers at the Diet of Worms. They had basically given him a choice. You either recant all that you've taught. In fact, they took all of his books he had written. They laid them on a table before him. They said, you either recant all that you've taught about God's Word and the Bible being sufficient for people or you're going to be found a heretic and you'll be excommunicated out of the Catholic Church. And here's what Luther said. He said, unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is held captive to the Word of God. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Now listen, folks. When we really get to understand how important the Bible is and that it's inspired of God and it's God's words, not our words, the Bible becomes the final authority for our lives. And so as we close today, I want to ask you the same question I asked you earlier. How important is the Bible to you? How important is it? Let me throw this in. I know some people are readers and some people are not. I, I, I've always loved to read. So it's easy for me to, to read. I know some people have a more difficult time. My dad pastored a small church in Providence, Rhode Island when I was younger. And the man who helped him start his church was, was a man named Joe. Joe was a, a big black man. And uh, he had come out of a, a, a really rough life and had come to know Christ as a Savior. But Joe could not read. He had never learned how to read. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with the old King James Bible. And Joe taught himself how to read from reading the old thou, thee, and thy King James Bible because he wanted to know God's Word because it was important to him.
The Bible's unlike any other book. I believe this with all my heart, and I'm willing to say it to you. Maybe you're not a reader, but if you will take the time to make God's Word important to you, you can understand it. You can learn to love it. Because as you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit works in our lives and teaches us the Bible. And so ultimately the question is this, with all the other excuses gone, how important is the Bible to you and to me? Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, thank you today for your word. Lord, thank you for Peter writing these words that challenge us. Thank you for him writing not only about the importance of the word, but even giving us a little hint into how we got the Bible. And that it was not just men who spoke, it was men who were carried along and guided by the Spirit of God. And they gave us exactly the words you wanted us to know. Lord, may we have the same spirit as Martin Luther. May we stand by the Word of God. May that be our authority. Not the courts of our land, not the laws that our government passes, not what culture dictates to us. But God, may our conscience be bound by the Word of God. And may we believe it, may we love it, may we cherish it, and may we have such a spirit about us of joy and love for people that when people ask why we're so hopeful, we can then in turn be ready to share God's Word with people so they can come to know Christ as their Savior. And Lord, we thank you for all these things. We praise you today. And we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us. We will close with one song.